Thank you, Patrick, um, and to Sarah and to Peter for um, taking care of all of the all of the work that makes this possible. Um, and welcome to everybody who's joining today's talk. As Patrick said, I'm Jenna Lloyd, Associate Professor of Geography at here at UW Madison. Um, so I won't rehearse the introduction I gave for Dr. Kelly yesterday beyond reiterating that Dr. Kelly is a leading historian and theorist of social movements, black culture and the black radical tradition. So for today's introduction, I thought I'd offer some thoughts on how I encountered doctor's work, Dr. Kelly's work, pardon me, as a geographer, focusing in on freedom dreams, the black radical tradition. Widely celebrated at the time of its publication in 2002, it's fair to say that this book is having another moment. Uh, whether seen um, as a central part of the study and struggle reading group that convened this past year across the country, both inside and outside of prisons, or in this um, fabulous hoodie that I'm wearing, which is maybe a little bit hard to see from Madison's own queer and feminist bookstore called Room of One's Own. And right in the middle of the hoodie is Freedom Dreams by Robin Kelly. Um, and I promise I won't send you this one. I have, we have other, another one to send to you. Um, so it's having a moment. Um, in graduate school, where I was trained by Marxist scholars, I encountered fundamental geographic categories like land, capitalist uneven development, and internationalism. These are all central parts of uh, freedom dreams. But I encountered them in reading this book. I, re I encountered these categories anew. The book redirected and re reinvigorated these categories through tracing long arcs of black imagination and freedom struggle across time and space. At the time when people around the world were taking to the streets to oppose um, the US led war on Iraq, Freedom Dream sustained a sense of possibility resonant with how Miriam Kaba refers to hope as a discipline. This imagination, Dr. Kelly has noted in an interview is not utopian. Utopia after all means nowhere. So freedom dreams are emergent to particular places as people work to change the conditions of their lives. Such as um, for those of you who gathered with us yesterday, as we saw with yesterday's talk on the combined organizing against policing and abandonment by capital in Cincinnati. His attention to the spatial politics of race and racial economies of cities is a thread through also race rebels and your mama's dysfunctional. And what his dialectical imagination enables is not just an analysis of capital flows, but also of how um, black and working class intellectuals and cultural workers have created critical ways for treating land and justice differently. Finally, Dr. Kelly shows us how surrealists and black feminists um, have fundamentally transformed a terrain of political struggle. And this is like what blew my mind when I was like, reading that and it continues to do so. So showing this explosion of Marxist thought offers new ways of thinking of struggles against capitalism as also necessarily against racism, necessarily against heteropatriarchy and is occurring in the realms of social reproduction and community building that remain as magical on rereading this year as they were 20 years ago. So thank you again and welcome Dr. Kelly. Wow. That, that was as good as yesterday. <laughs> and it's so interesting because I'm like such a big fan. I saw a couple of my students come into the, um, from the waiting room and they know that I'm always talking about health rights or civil rights, uh, which is your brilliant work on Los Angeles, which is to me, I mean, as a, you're a geographer, but it's a great work of history. And then in my neoliberalism class, I spend in quite a bit of time uh, drawing from both borders and bases, uh, and, you know, talking about like really the origins of deportation um, policy in the U.S., which we think, you know, somehow was recent. <laughs> forget about Haiti, forget about Reaganism and all that stuff. So thank you, thank you so much. I'm so excited. Um, okay, uh, yeah, Freedom Dreams is is going. It's having another moment. Um, the good news for everyone is that since it's, a, it's available as a free PDF everywhere, you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> so, uh, so, so most people don't actually see the actual book itself. Um, not that I need royalties or anything. Um, so today 
this lecture, I'm, I'm gonna admit to you two things. I'm gonna confess two things. One, um, my health is not great. So I haven't been feeling so good because of I have like long COVID and it's affecting me. Um, but the second thing is that this is really a work in progress, meaning that I made the most progress on this work at four o'clock this morning. So it's a little bumpy. I don't have all those fancy slides I had yesterday. So you have to kind of look at my terrible haircut, actually non-haircut uh, in myself and then just kind of follow along as I try to make sense of some ideas I've been having. And these are ideas that have been circulating for some time, but really came to the fore uh, during the rebellion, um, rebellions of, uh, of some spring, summer 2020. Now, why am I writing this uh, chapter? I mean, if, if it wasn't for people like, you know, um, Taryn Williamson, who wrote this great book called Scandalize My Name, um, and if it wasn't for people like, you know, uh, Emily Thuma and, and others, um, I probably wouldn't be thinking about some of these questions, and especially if it wasn't for Margaret Prescott, who I'm going to talk about uh, at the end of this talk. But why am I writing these chapters? I mean, it should become clear in the talk, but let me just say at the outset that I was struck by the fact that 2020 was the deadliest year for transgender people of color, especially transgender women of color. And with the pandemic causing a spike in domestic violence, it seemed that violence against all women, especially black women, um, just wasn't part of the kind of public discourse that surrounded the question of police violence. Um, and certainly say her name has shined a light on black women subjected to state violence uh, but except for abolition feminists who have really developed an analysis linking other forms of violence, um, whether we call it, um, uh, you know, intimate partner violence or other forms of violence, um, but they've linked it to uh, the carceral state and to, um, and to the police. The abolitionist critique of the police is not only about the harm and, and talking about the, the you know, um, the feminist abolitionist uh, police, a critique of the police, not only about the harm they inflict, but also uh, their utter failure and inability to keep us safe. Part of the history of the failure of police um, can be seen literally in the massive numbers of unsolved murders of black women, native women, and women of color, more generally. So my talk today attempts to link the current struggles to make Black trans lives matter uh, to an earlier and ongoing feminist struggle against Black femicide. And first, let me just give you a, a trigger warning. Um, I will not be talking about the killing of, uh, well, no, let me just back up. I will be talking about the killing of Black women, but um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm, I'm going to avoid describing in any detail the manner in which Black women were killed. I mean, we're talking about killings in epic proportions. Um, though it's important to acknowledge, and I'm going to do this in the book, that for activists who've been fighting uh, to bring an end to mass um, uh, Black femicide, to femicide period, uh, how they died the insidious and gruesome nature, brutal nature of what happened to their bodies did matter a great deal. Because um, as I'm gonna suggest, homicide and femicide are not exactly the same things. Um, I'm gonna write in my book about this. And in a couple of cases this afternoon, it is important to offer uh, occasional descriptions to underscore the misogynist character of the violence against black women and to distinguish between homicide and femicide. Um, I, I, and I apologize in advance and will try to do the best I can to indicate this when some triggering detail might come up. Um, if you want to avoid it altogether, I mean, it may make sense just to leave the discussion, but, um, but I'm not, but I'm trying not, I'm trying to avoid this thing that the press does. And that is, you know, play up um, the spectacular details 
of the violence, which itself is traumatizing. Okay, so, and let me just say, the very first uh, couple sentences uh, does have one small traumatizing, or I shouldn't say small, but a traumatizing detail. So you may want to shut off, you know, the sound just for um, about two minutes or so. Okay, so anyway, I'm, I'm beginning the story um, with uh, Dominique uh, uh, Remy Fells. Uh, let me just let me just start. So on the morning of June 8, 2020, as millions of people took to the street to protest the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, a fisherman found the dismembered body of the 27-year-old Dominique Remy Fells on the banks of the Schuylkill River in Southwest Philadelphia. Uh, Akhenaten uh, Jones was recently charged with the murder. Um, having been extradited from Los Angeles, and he's currently a, a awaiting trial. Now, I'm going to spare you the details, but they knew each other. Uh, he was described variously as a friend and intimate partner. Uh, Fells was a Black trans woman from central Pennsylvania, born July 30th, 1992, in Sullings Grove, uh, which is just about 50, 60 miles north of, of York. She grew up in, in York, mainly. Um, also central Pennsylvania. York is a predominantly white city uh, with an earlier history of police violence that led to a series of black rebellions from 1968 to 1969. Her friends called her Dom or Remy and she attended public schools in York and graduated from William Penn High School class of 2010. Uh, she began studies at Cheney University in Delaware where she majored in fashion design with a concentration in business studies, but then left school after about a year. She moved to Philadelphia and was trying to create a career for herself in the fashion industry. She's a very talented designer. Uh, she designed her own clothes. Uh, she was described by those close to her as happy and generous, caring, affectionate, and, and very dynamic. Um, but she did struggle with drug addiction uh, with bouts of homelessness. And in, it seems that she was compelled into sex work occasionally to survive. She lived off and on at the Morris Home, which was a residential recovery program uh, in Philadelphia, geared specifically to serve transgender and gender variant communities. And it was there in January, 2019, that she organized Rock the Runway, uh, a trans empowerment fashion show. A few months before her death, uh, Dominique was attempting to return to the Morris home, but there were no beds available. Now her family was solidly working class and it appears that her parents, Keith and Terry Edmonds, um, as well as her sisters, Desiree and Dior, embraced her and accepted her identity. Um, I don't know all the details, um, but they, uh, uh, but she, you know, but Dominique often spoke of her mother as her best friend. Um, they all spoke at uh, uh, at a rally, spoke affectionately about her at a, a march and rally held in her name in West Philadelphia. And Terry Edmonds told the Philadelphia Inqui Inquirer, a uh, quote, the fact that we have to come here and march in the streets of Philadelphia and others are doing the same across the country and around the world is disheartening to us. Tolerance and acceptance should be a natural common way of life. Now by tolerance, I suspect that she was referring to more than just her transgender identity. Uh, she was not, um, uh, Dominique was not as Miriam Ka Kaba would put it, um, the perfect victim. Uh, but she fought hard to be seen and valued as did those close to her. Her best friend, uh, Bria Harkham presented an original poem which read in part, quote, they're calling you an icon, girl, and they're calling you a voice, but they will never know the classy, beautiful soul, soul that carries such poise. I don't think you know how great you are, how amazing you were with all your flaws. Now, Harkham's words were, um, I read them as a powerful critique of the ways in which Black women's lives are valued and devalued. As a victim, 
of brutal anti-trans violence, um, brutal misogynist violence, she was she had become an icon and a voice um, to some. In fact, not to maybe not to as many because not many people know about her case. But she had become an icon and a voice. Uh, but profiles of her uh, in the press often left out her struggles. And those that did not leave out her struggles, but actually talked about her struggles with poverty and addiction, framed them almost entirely as personal and not structural. And the choices she made were constrained by the structural reality that Black trans people have a 26% unemployment rate, 41% of Black trans people um, have been homeless, uh, more than five times the general population, 34% of the Black trans community have household incomes of less than $10,000. And these numbers are for trans men and women. For women, the figures are likely to be more devastating. And yet, Harcum was insisting that we see all of her and value her life as we would anyone else. Her sister Dior uh, made the point sharply in a tweet asking, why do people have to be dead for others to finally want to protect them? Less than 24 hours after Fells' murder, another Black trans woman was killed, Rhea Milton in Ohio. These back-to-back uh, -back killings occurred as activists in the transgender and queer community were actually planning a silent march on Pride Weekend uh, to begin at the Brooklyn Museum called the Brooklyn Liberation Mar March. And you know, in order to draw attention to anti-trans violence, especially directed at uh, trans people of color, According to the Human Rights Campaign, up to that point, um, at least 14 transgender or gender nonconforming people have been fatally shot or killed by other types of violence, or killed by other types of violence. Uh, they gathered to mourn Monica Diamond of Charlotte, Lexi of Harlem, uh, Nina Pop killed in Missouri, Tony McDade shot by police in Tallahassee, Florida, Selena, uh, uh, Selena Reyes Hernandez, uh, who died in Chicago and, and many others. And as it turned out, 2020 did indeed prove to be the deadliest year on record for transgender people of color. And the turnout for the, for the march uh, surprised even the organizers. They, some 15,000 people showed up. And it was a very powerful, uh, powerful event. But compared to the demonstrations uh, in the wake of Floyd's murder, it paled in comparison. Now, why is not so obvious? Even as a matter of police repression, most of us know that transgender people of color are far, far more likely to be stopped, frisked, harassed, and beaten by police, and sexually assaulted by police as well, who presume that all transgender people are sex workers. And often, uh, in situations where they're forced to trade sex to avoid arrest. Recent studies show transgender women uh, were six to seven times more likely to experience physical violence in their interactions with police um, than others stopped by the police. Um, and, and this rate is much higher for transgender women of color. But this is also a story uh, of the failure of police even their complicity uh, in, in these deaths and in the violence, um, their complicity in their failure to protect uh, black lives, but in particular black women's lives. That is to say trans, cisgender, gender nonconforming uh, uh, women's lives. Um, the Brooklyn Liberation March should not be seen as part of, uh, I'm sorry, the, the march should be seen as actually part of a continuum growing out of a much longer struggle against uh, Black femicide, which has been a critical issue for all Black women and really central to the formation of uh, what they call third wave Black feminism. Vulnerability of Black women um, is, was not just a matter or, or is not just a matter of state violence, though the state is complicit in creating conditions for their vulnerability. And of course, as, as I mentioned, the crisis has been exacerbated by the pandemic, 
which has led to an uptick in domestic violence and murders. On the other hand, um, we shouldn't be too surprised by the lack of a response or this, this, the limited response. There continues to be a longstanding pattern of, sol of sort of siloing off uh, such violence as non-political. Um, that is, whether it's intimate partner violence or violence that may be random violence, uh, or perceived to be random violence, not really random, it's routine. Um, whereas Black trans, li trans Lives Matter protests insist the opposite, that these killings are indeed political. They are system they're systemic. Uh, they are facilitated, if not sanctioned by the state. And to that end, such violence requires uh, a, a political collective radical response to push back. And that alone makes it political. You know, that alone makes it political. Um, what's required to bring an end to it. And, you know, in many ways, the Black Trans Lives Matter as a movement um, and transgender communities struggle against violence articulates, uh, you know, what Angela Davis and others call abolition feminism. The radical politics driving really the best of our movements, I, I would argue. Um, and by that, uh, abolition feminism doesn't just mean, you know, creating a world without police and prisons, but a world, uh, you know, that values life and without the values that produce police and punishment, a world based on radical freedom, mutual accountability and passionate reciprocity. Um, abolition feminists recognize how all women of color and queer folks are simultaneously criminalized and rendered disposable. It's not enough to say the names of those killed by police, but also the tens of thousands whose deaths, disappearances, and abuse go unresolved. Um, in other words, police not only enact harm through direct violence, but by the criminal justice system's inability to address gender-based and intimate violence. Uh, carceral feminists support police and prison as the solution, and abolition feminists argue that the current system makes matters worse. Locking men, by locking men up um, or perpetrators up in cages and reinforcing violent behavior, uh, pushing women uh, for deviating from heterosexual nuclear family norms, stripping them of social safety net, and all the while never addressing the problem of sexual violence and um, as victims. As Beth Ritchie reveals in her brilliant book, Arrested Justice, we are all saddled with a system that simply, simply locks perpetrators up, um, punishes uh, victims for deviating from, from um, heterosexual norms. Um, and she offers a searing critique of the limits of turning to the state to deal with these forms of violence, not only because it further expands the prison population and the behaviors associated with caging human beings, but in her words, it precludes the development of a sustained critique of the state's role in causing, complicating, or being complicit with male violence against Black women. As a result, state-sanctioned violence that women experience, a critical compounding layer of harm is beyond uh, reproach. Abolition feminism is a movement dedicated to eradicating all forms of oppression and exploitation, ending state-sanctioned violence, replacing police, military, and prisons with genuine, humane, non-carceral paths for safety and justice, freeing the body from the constraints of inherited and imposed normativities, protecting the earth, and ending precarity of all kinds. And that means, um, rejecting the current focus on using the same carceral system to punish police officers. Um, and this is the work, I mean, this is the work that needs to be done. And this is the work that um, Maram Kaba has been talking about for a very long time. And so when she says, we have to make violence unthinkable in our culture, 
we have to make interpersonal violence unthinkable. This is the work that's before us. And this is what I wanna talk about uh, today. Now, there's been really important organizing around the intersection of these issues. The role of law enforcement in perpetuating sexual assault, especially against women of color. I mean, the statistics on this are really clear. The Cato Institute revealed that sexual misconduct was the second highest category of complaints filed against police officers, a second only to excessive use of force. And of course, the case of Oklahoma City police officer Daniel Holtzclaw uh, charged in August 2014 for sexually assaulting at least eight black women during traffic stops while on duty um, brought attention to this issue in a very palpable way. Um, and thanks to the critical scholarship of people like um, Emily uh, Thuma, author of All Our Trials, Alexis Pauline Gums. I mean, there's a long list, I won't name everybody, but uh, we, you know, we see that the Black, Indigenous, and Latinx women's resistance to sexual violence is an essential part of our understanding of prison abolition. Uh, the cases of Joanne Little, uh, Ella Ellison, Desi Woods, Inez uh, uh, Garcia, and Yvonne uh, Wanro in the 1970s and 80s show how a racist, patriarchal, classist criminal justice system denies women the right to self-defense, the right to defend themselves from assault, uh, but was actually forced to shift a little as a result of mass action. Um, so of course their cases provide an historical framework for understanding and building uh, the defense of Marissa Alexander and uh, Santoyo Brown and others. But even as these uh, uh, center, I mean, I'm sorry, even these center uh, on, on cases of direct state violence and carceral state. Um, so what I wanna do is to examine, uh, you know, movements that mobilize against the routine murder of black women, uh, murders usually involving uh, sexual violence, almost always targeting poor women perceived to be disposable and more often than not um, attributed, uh, individual attributed to individual serial killers. And, and I'm gonna suggest that that's not always the case. Um, these campaigns have been critical to the formation of black and third world feminism, especially in the 70s and 80s. Um, it's important to revisit these campaigns uh, because even if they weren't calling for the abolition of prisons or police, I would argue that um, at some level they promoted an incredibly expansive political vision that's worth revisiting. They recognized early on the class and economic dimensions of, um, of black femicide and that black women uh, were vulnerable uh, or the ways in which black women were vulnerable uh, to premature death because they were subjected to state regulation, containment, discipline and punishment and deemed not worthy of protection. Uh, and there's also the issue of how they die. Um, and I agree with um, Shatima Threadcraft and Lisa Miller with this really interesting article uh, that make that argue that we need to make a distinction between black homicide and, and black femicide. And they write, quote, men and women are killed in different ways with men more likely to be killed in public uh, by a stranger or an acquaintance uh, during the course of criminal activity. Okay. Um, and of course, not surprisingly, black and indigenous women are the most likely victims of serial murder. Um, there's a very long history. And in most instances, uh, that history is not documented because these stories don't always merit uh, press reports. Um, they don't always merit coverage. And one of the first examples, in fact, of the 20th century occurred between 1909 and 1913 uh, in Atlanta, where at least 19 black women, almost all, domestic workers were found dead. And the suspect was thought to be a singular black man that alone 
uh, and, and that alone prompted these sensational accounts uh, where the, the perpetrator was called Atlant the Atlanta Ripper and the Black Butcher. Um, the killings were particularly grisly in every case involving the slashing and disfiguring of faces. And there were some prominent Black pastors and middle-class Black leadership in Atlanta that petitioned the mayor to do something to stop the killings. Um, and some even calling for uh, the Atlanta police uh, to hire black officers uh, to try to you know, deal with these issues. Um, but at least one black minister, uh, the very prominent Reverend Henry Hugh Proctor of the First Congregational um, Church, blamed black idleness and immorality for the murders, uh, blamed the community for allowing the conditions that would permit a murderer to thrive. He did stop short though of blaming the women for their own deaths. Now, uh, when serial killings of black women became even more newsworthy in the 1970s, 1970s, this wasn't always the case. In fact, all across the country, black women were being killed uh, and nearly all uh, were reported to be um, prostitutes or sex workers, whether they were or not. Um, Barbara Smith, co-founder of the Combahee River Collective, who, as we'll see, helped organize a campaign to draw attention to the murder of 12 Black women in the Boston area in the late 1970s, wrote, quote, the victims were universally described as runaways, prostitutes, or drug addicts who deserved to die because of how they lived. The distorted portrayal of the girls and women could be expected in a city notorious uh, uh, for racism, but there was a particular sexist turn because the victims were not black, but female. Now the killings of uh, five black women in and around Stanford, Connecticut was among the first cases to draw national attention uh, in this period. Uh, the victims died between 1967 and 1971 and all, all were strangled and left near Merritt Parkway. Um, and according to press accounts, um, the press claimed they all were sex workers. The black community of, of Stanford demanded action, um, protested in front of the police department, uh, pressed the police, the Stanford Police Department to um, create some kind of task force. In 1972, um, they did arrest and indict a white postal worker uh, and self-styled preacher named Benjamin Miller Jr. who pleaded not guilty uh, of the crimes. And Miller was alleged to have met his victims either in church or while giving these street corner sermons to black women in areas uh, that were known uh, for, uh, for sex work. And he had a history of mental illness. In fact, he had been hospitalized, as, uh, institutionalized uh, earlier in the 1950s. Uh, and diagnosed uh, as schizophrenic. But police really pressed him into a confession. He was later ruled not guilty by reason of insanity and committed to a hospital. And he remained there until, his, until he died. However, just weeks after his arrest, another man named Robert uh, Lupinacci was arrested while attempting to strangle another black woman in the same vicinity as the other victims. Uh, and after year, years of appeals, uh, Miller was actually exonerated, uh, but uh, Lupinacci was never charged with the crimes despite overwhelming evidence that he had killed the others. He was familiar with um, uh, some of the women who died and, and other things, but he was never charged. Um, he did serve time in prison on another charge though, uh, briefly. Now, the other significant case uh, of this period took place in Washington, D.C. Uh, between 1971 and 1972, uh, known as the Freeway Phantom Murders. And in, and in this case, seven Black girls, ages 10 to 18, uh, were killed uh, within a 17-month uh, span and their bodies dumped along the highways. Uh, very similar to the Stanford case, uh, the DC Police Department was very slow to respond. 
And in fact, when the first victim, which was a seventh grader named Carol Spinks, was discovered by a group of school children on May 1st, 1971, the district commander uh, refused to send additional officers to investigate right away because allegedly he said, quote, the department was, was inundated with war protesters, basically anti-war protesters is what he was referring to. And they had to patrol the streets and control the jails. Uh, then two days later, uh, the body of a 14 year old uh, girl, Angela Denise Barnes was found. Now hers was the only death that resulted in an arrest and conviction. And in this case it was two uh, black DC police officers, Edward Selman and Tommy Simmons, uh, who were convicted of kidnapping and murder in July of 1974. Uh, but no prosecutor was able to link them to the other victims. And it's interesting because it's surprising how little is written about, um, about this case, um, the so-called freeway phantom murders. And to this day, um, none of the other, um, uh, the, 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 none of the other victims, there, there've been no, no, um, no one's been arrested um, or charged with the death of the other victims. Um, though there's still people looking at it um, to this day. Uh, not surprisingly, you know, the fact that the cases haven't been solved, uh, Tommy Musgrove, who joined the DC police in 1972, literally at the tail end of this, of, of this spate of murders, and would later head the homicide uh, unit, admitted the obvious. He said, quote, those black girls didn't mean anything to anybody. I'm talking about on, uh, on the police department. If those girls had been white, they would have been put more manpower on it. And there's no doubt about that. Now, what's also striking about the DC case is that the DC Rape Crisis Center, which a lot's been written about, was established in the spring of 1972, making it one of the first of its kind in the United States. But as far as I can tell, it did not make the so-called freeway phantom murders a priority of its work. Its founding collective consisted primarily of young, white, working class and middle class women uh, who were involved in women's liberation uh, organizations. And many of, them, many of them had been rape survivors. But only once in 1974 did a representative from the DC Rape Crisis Center, in this case, uh, Brenda McSwain, uh, with African-American, participate in a kind of public forum, at least a radio um, show, uh, dealing with the murders. And, and by the late 70s, of course, we know through lots of scholarship, um, including M Emily Thuma's uh, terrific book, that the center, uh, and certainly some of the writings of Loretta uh, uh, Ross, the center itself had brought on a stalwart um, Black feminists like Deirdre Wright, Loretta Ross, and Ken J. Uh, Ture, Yolanda, uh, Yolanda Ward who really shifted direction uh, to a radical kind of third world political vision that linked sexual assault to indigenous sovereignty, to health and welfare rights, to prison uh, conditions and prison abolition, to police brutality, uh, anti-racism, anti-militarism and reproductive freedom. But by that time, it's like the late seventies, it seemed like the, um, the freeway phantom murders had kind of lost any steam or kind of dis it didn't entirely disappear, but it wasn't really a priority for anyone at the time. Um, and what's very important about um, the shift in the DC Rape Crisis Center uh, was that out of that shift was also a response to a debate within the center over the role of the police. Um, the tendency on the part of of, as I suggested, kind of carceral feminists would be like, we need more police protection, more police involvement. Whereas uh, for women of color and uh, progressive uh, uh, elements in the, in the center, um, the police were the part of the problem. And clearly, you know, besides the fact that the police were slow to respond um, and could not be trusted, the, I mean, it's important to, to kind of recognize 
that the one uh, murder case that was quote unquote solved, if, as it were, involved two uh, uh, police officers. Um, so it kind of makes sense to figure out strategies uh, in which the police are not involved. And I'm gonna talk about that, which brings me to um, uh, very briefly, I wanna talk about um, the, the uh, Roxbury murders and the Komahi River Collective. Um, this is something we know much more about, um, but in Boston in the late 70s, uh, specifically 1979, uh, there was an organized grassroots campaign to investigate and try to stop the killing of black women. These other incidences have had like political responses, but in some respects, what happened in Boston was probably up to that point, the most robust uh, political response to um, these serial murders. In any case, um, it's the story we know more about um, through the work of the Kumbahi River Collective and work on them. And I won't go into detail on the campaign since it's been written about elsewhere, but I just wanna make a few brief points before I talk about the, the main thing. Um, and that is um, at least 12 black women were slain um, in 1979 between, um, at least up to September 1979, um, at least between March and September, before February, September, uh, mainly in the neighborhoods of Roxbury, Dorchester and South End. In response to these murders, um, Organizations were formed like Crisis, for example, formed specifically in response to the murders, but also um, a number of organizations came together like Community Programs Against Sexual Assault, or known as KPASA, uh, the Roxbury Multi-Service multi Center, the Kumbahi River Collective, of course, in Crisis. Um, and they form, the, the 20 organizations all together form the Coalition for Women's Safety. Now, the coalition uh, included the Dorchester Greenlight Program, which was designed to create safe houses for women, uh, especially since the police, again, were both unreliable and untrustworthy. Uh, and to become a safe house uh, entailed, you know, uh, being screened, uh, going through an orientation uh, 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 session uh, where they undergo self-defense training and learn rules of conduct. Uh, and when they go through all this whole process, they get a green light bulb that they place on, in a porch light. And when it's turned on, it means that your house uh, becomes a safe haven. It kind of, it's a single signal of safety for anyone in trouble. Now the coalition focused on educating communities on the issue of violence against women, uh, particularly aimed at young women. I mean, the educational uh, program they looked into investigating uh, the licensing and operating regulations of taxi cab drivers because a number of these cases of, of uh, assault uh, uh, involved um, taxi drivers. They held self-defense uh, workshops and gun workshops. They went door to door to discuss security. They held you know, small support, uh, small group, uh, small support groups for people in neighborhoods where these murders occurred, trained health service workers to deal with the needs specifically of um, Latinx women who uh, are, are assault victims. Um, and they were dedicated to trying to set up trust funds for the children of murdered uh, women. Um, they also built alliances with some of the uh, uh, white feminists across the river in Cambridge and Somerville who form the support group for women's safety. And most importantly, um, the coalition organized a number of demonstrations, uh, fundraisers, poetry readings, marches, um, uh, you know, various events, working often with uh, Take, the Take Back the Night Coalition. Uh, but there were important um, splits or divisions that reveal uh, the way the sort of radical way in which the coalition and, and in particular the Kumbahi River Collective was thinking about the relationship uh, between um, the anti-racist work, criminal justice, um, and the feminist work of, of, of dealing with uh, sexual assault and protecting women. 
Um, so they ended up taking a stand uh, in the defense of Willie Saunders, who was an African-American man uh, falsely accused of rape in the predominantly white well-to-do community of Brighton. He was actually a house painter working in one of the apartment complexes where uh, uh, some white women uh, uh, had been raped. And the presumption was that because he was black and he was there, he had to have been uh, guilty. So he was arrested and they realized that he didn't even fit the description, not even close to it. So they stood behind this, uh, this campaign. Um, and so in doing that, as they're simultaneously trying to fight, uh, trying to defend uh, Saunders, but also trying to find the killer slash rapist terrorizing their communities, they linked issues of racism, patriarchy, and sexual violence in ways that some of the Black men involved and some of the white women involved couldn't quite grasp, um, but really pushed in a, a far more radical uh, agenda. And also the arrests themselves um, around these cases as they proceeded called into question this narrative of the disturbed individual, the social outlier responsible for all of these murders um, because there were different perpetrators of, and, and, and what it kind of showed was the routine nature of this violence. Um, now, what I want to do is kind of close here, um, not so much close, but really talk about one, one last um, campaign here in Los Angeles uh, led by Margaret Prescott, and that is the, the Black Coalition Fighting Back uh, Serial Murders. Uh, and you might, you might know the case, it was a film uh, largely about it, a film about it, um, although the perspective is a little bit different from what I'm going to talk about, called Tales of the Grim Sleeper. And uh, Prescott organized um, uh, the Black Coalition in January of 1986. The first woman found dead in South LA was in 1983. So for three years, or really two and a half years, I think, um, the LAPD kind of kept this information that Black women were being killed in South LA from the public. And when it was revealed, uh, Margaret Prescott and you know went to work with a whole group of organizers and they developed an alliance with the LA Take Back the Night Coalition. Um, at the time, the, this unknown person or people, persons, um, was known as the South, South Side Slayer. Uh, and at some point in 1989, there were 17 women uh, found dead with no um, uh, one arrest, which you know we could talk about of a police officer who turned out uh, wasn't uh, responsible at all. Um, uh, but and it looked like he was actually set up by other cops um, in that case. But there were weekly vigils that the Black Coalition uh, and Take Back the Night uh, uh, Coalition uh, organized outside of the police headquarters at Parker Center. Um, police Chief uh, Daryl Gates dismissed all the attacks on the police or the critique of the police by uh, Margaret Prescott and the coalition. Uh, he called her and the, the women asinine and, and dummies uh, because what they were arguing for was a more robust response saying that they were not only slow to respond, but that they kept the information under wraps and they did nothing. Um, beyond the scope of my talk, uh, what happened was um, in around 2004 or so, 2005, um, after the last murder was in 1989, the murder started up again uh, and hence the name Grim Sleeper because from that point on until uh, his arrest um, uh, around two, I'm thinking 2010, around his arrest, um, Lonnie Franklin's arrest, for who was um, uh, charged with, with these murders and many others, um, there was a kind of a lull. Now, I'm not gonna get into the details of the, of the case. It looks like he was responsible for uh, not just the 17 and not just 20, 30, but maybe a hundred, maybe more 
of these murders, but it, but it's quite possible that he was one of not just not just one, but maybe more than one. But my point, the focus of my uh, talk here, is not on that particular case, but on how Margaret Prescott came to under, came to work uh, around the um, South Side Slayer case, how she formed the Black Coalition, and specifically how she framed the issue. Um, because as I pointed out, the charge or the assumption that many of the victims were themselves uh, sex workers was something that was often taken as a way to dismiss the victims, as a way to say, you know what, um, that's an unfair charge. You, know, you think all black women are, are sex workers. Um, but what she's saying is that in fact, the women that she was working with were. And she started out working uh, around issues of sex work, which is how she got into uh, this particular case. So she had a different perspective on this. Let me just tell her story uh, very briefly. Um, so Mar Margaret Prescott was born in 1948 in Barbados. And she uh, grew up there up through her teenage years. In 1962, her family moved to New York City. And almost as soon as she got to New York, she got involved in a protest against um, a medical center in Brooklyn that didn't hire black people, probably with, with CORE. She went on to earn a degree from Long Island University. She did some graduate work uh, at Columbia uh, Teachers College. Uh, she distinguished herself as a teacher, uh, first in elementary school. Um, she worked around the Ocean Hill Brownsville uh, uh, case, pushing for community control in New York. She also taught um, uh, remedial education to adults, uh, and then in 1980 moved to Los Angeles. But in the 70s, during her work as a teacher and activist, um, that's when she, uh, she met uh, Wilmot Brown uh, and uh, eventually came in contact with Selma James uh, and had become interested in uh, the Wages for Housework campaign. And uh, Margaret and Brown are co-founders of the International Black Women for Wages for Housework, uh, which is formed in 1976. But bef even before that, around that time, she became interested in working ar uh, around the rights of sex workers. Um, she was part of the New York State delegation at that attended the National Women's Conference in Houston where she pushed the conference to change its resolution on women and public assistance uh, to substitute welfare for wage, because she was arguing that you know, welfare was, should be a wage, should be seen as payment for unpaid work and not just a kind of handout. Uh, and what's important is that she spent um, 20 years uh, on and off working with the United Nations on women's issues especially the International Women's uh, Women Count Network uh, that lobbied the UN to measure and include unwaged women's labor in its national statistics um, and gross domestic product. Um, she did a lot of other things, anti-militarism work. She's, people know her now. Um, she's a host of uh, KPFK's um, uh, uh, Soldier in the Truth uh, show. And she's one of the co-founders of of the International Women of Color in the Global Women's Strike um, and, and many, many things. Um, but what I wanna focus on is, is how she, one, thought about the slogan, count all women's lives and how it fits both in terms of counting women's labor, but also counting women who made the choice uh, given the constraints on their lives to turn to sex work. Um, so she had a unique perspective uh, from Black women uh, for wages for housework uh, on sex work. Um, she defended sex work with, as, as work with dignity, deserving protection. And that means um, the characterization of Black women as victims, Black women victims of murder and rape and serial murders as prostitutes was never really an issue for her. It wasn't an issue for her to prove. In fact, she made a point of it 
to say that they were worthy of protection. And to be worthy of protection meant that she was also arguing on behalf of the abolition of all laws, not the regulation of prostitution or sex work, but the abolition of all laws because her argument and the argument of her comrades was that um, by having any kind of regulation only strengthens the role of pimps and others who control the sex work industry. So she was a, um, a member of uh, US Prostitutes Collective. She worked in San Francisco um, in 1980, organizing, trying to form a, create a law office there and, and organizing recruits. And she co-authored co -authored a, a mimeograph pamphlet uh, called Money for Prostitutes is Money for Black Women. Uh, and I just wanna um, quickly, um, I'm gonna skip over some things and just read from a, a passage which says a lot about the way she's thinking about the defense of, of sex workers. She says, a ghetto is built around prostitutes like the ghetto in which all black women in one way or another are forced to live. It is a ghetto where we are branded, denied our legal rights and isolated from other women. If we are on welfare doing the work of taking care of our children and ourselves that all women do, we are branded as cheats, as if we are getting something for nothing. If we are lesbians refusing to sleep with men as a way to have some independence in our lives, we are branded as freaks. It is a ghetto where if we are not dependent on an individual man to protect us, whether it's a husband, a boyfriend, or a pimp, we are considered fair game. It is a ghetto where even if we don't work the streets as prostitutes, we are often forced to sell our sexual services in exchange for rent, for food, for gas and light, in exchange for being left alone by police. So it's a really brilliant statement which shows the general precarity of black women and their vulnerability uh, being not the result of bad choices, but the result of bad laws, racism, sexism, and class oppression. Now to conclude, um, um, it's not an accident, because I see my time's running out, that gendered violence emerged as a key abolitionist issue. Um, and in some ways, you know, um, you can look at some of the other developments that followed, uh, you know, the formation of Incite, uh, Women of Color Against Violence and Critical Resistance that really laid the groundwork for thinking through the relationship between all forms of violence and violence against women and uh, the, in the carceral state, where they issued a statement calling for strategies and analyses that address both state and interpersonal violence, particularly violence against women, and the development of safe community-based responses to violence independent of criminal justice system and accountable to survivors of sexual and domestic violence. Um, we also see in 2000, um, uh, following the, the police killing of two teenage women of color in Brooklyn, the, uh, the collective Sister to Sister created Sisters Liberated Ground as an alternative to calling the police to deal with gendered violence. And they were really building on this tradition of black and third world feminist anti-violence work, the Dorchester Green Light uh, 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 program, for example, um, and other strategies of abolition feminism to protect, uh, to create protected spaces where women were trained in self-defense and conflict resolution uh, through street performances, video screenings, discussions, and direct interventions that they dealt with violence as a community issue. Um, and you know, all these movements reject the prevailing wisdom that more prison or jail time, more punitive measures uh, represent the answer. And they instead want to abolish these systems, abolish caging, finding transformative justice, not just restorative justice approaches and develop a critique of state harm uh, through publications like No More Cages and Through the Looking Glass. Um, so I don't have a really good conclusion, but I just wanna get us to think about, um, again, going back to the killing of trans people of color and its links to femicide uh, and to the links to reservations in Canada and the US uh, to indigenous women uh, to women on the border. Uh, these cases um, prove what black and third world feminists have been saying all along, that these are not aberrations. These are not random acts of violence. 
by dysfunctional disabled uh, individuals. Um, there are manifestations of the same state sanctioned violence and routine violence that we came out into the streets to fight in 2020. Um, and they have to be uh, incorporated. And before, uh, and they have to be linked again to the rest of the world, to the murder of Mario Frank Franco, for example, to femicide in India, China, South Africa. So to end with a quote, as Insight uh, puts it, in this society, safety and security will not be premised on violence or the threat of violence. It would be based on a collective commitment to guaranteeing the survival and care of all peoples. So with that, I will stop and take some, some questions. Sorry for going on. All right, well, thank you once again for another excellent and very thought provoking talk. And I'm sure it's provoked some questions as well. So we have about 20 minutes. We have a fairly significant number of attendees. So um, what I'm gonna ask you to do, those of you who wanna put forward a question is to keep them short. Um, we'll try to get to as many of you as possible. Robin mentioned yesterday that tomorrow's talk is gonna be a bit shorter and therefore there will be more time for questions and answers. And if we don't get to all of you today, we hope that you'll um, you know, get yourself in the queue very early on for tomorrow's Q&A session. So uh, just to review how we're going about this, at the bottom of your screen, uh, the one you can see that there's a participants option. When you click on that, you can click on raise hand and that will alert me that you'd like to ask a question. Um, I'm gonna ask people to use that, um, especially we'd like you to go on camera and activate both your camera and microphone. If however, you feel a little shy about that, you can ask a question in the chat function, which is the one immediately to the right of that. So maybe we'll take a couple at a time. So those of you who'd like to put forward a question, please go ahead and indicate by raising your hand. As people decide, I, I, only, I, I don't see many people, but I do see Donna Merch. Hi, Donna. No, she was here okay. yesterday too. She's great, giving a talk for us later this semester. Oh, really? Okay, I'm not gonna miss that. You know, the way I don't have like the gallery view, but I just have like, you know, just some people pop up. So I don't know who's, I'm too afraid to look at the gallery view because mm -hmm. I'm afraid to see people that I know and, and be embarrassed. Um, All right, so Adam has a question in okay. the chat. Um, and he says, given today is International Day for Sex Workers' Rights, can you say more of the on the intersection of abolition and sex worker rights? Um, oh, that's great. And you know something? I'm the first to confess it. I did not know that. And this is actually perfect because, um, you know, in some ways, Margaret Prescott and the work that she's been doing is really, really important as a kind of pioneering. Um, because, you know, if we take our take the story that she take the work that they were doing in the 1970s around um, sex workers' rights. Um, they were kind of pushing back. And here, you know, I think about um, Dean Spade's brilliant book about, you know, the idea of trans rights and the limits of rights. Um, and in some ways, they were kind of pushing back against forms of regulation in the name of rights that um, uh, that part of what rights can often do is create uh, a system through the same carceral system, same criminal justice system to try to, to bring justice without actually changing the conditions or the system itself. Um, and so in many ways, the argument for abolition, that is the abolition of all laws regulating um, sex workers, for example, even laws, um, that the abolition of those laws, which is what there was, they were arguing often against um, many of the feminists who were involved in the Take Back the Night Coalition. Some of them actually wouldn't even participate, the Sacramento group wouldn't participate with Margaret's uh, group, um, precisely because they felt that, um, that unless, that, that, that sex work actually does the very opposite. It actually promotes violence against women, it, you know, and this is the, and of course, this is an argument that was very popular in the 1970s and 80s um, at the time. And so in many ways, we have to come back to that. We got to come back to uh, the fact that in our, def in, 
even in the struggles of trans uh, and cisgender uh, uh, people against sexual violence, the way that we treat it sometimes as individual intimate violence doesn't allow for the kind of circulation of names and experiences by sex workers, for example, who, um, and this is a point that was actually brought up um, in Miriam Kaba's um, brand new book of essays, uh, that, that's, that um, people in the sex work industry shared ideas and shared names to protect each other from predators, from violent attacks, when they knew the state failed to do that. They knew the police couldn't do that. And so they created their own kind of counter database. When yesterday I talked about databases in the way in which black people are criminalized through them, this is a, a means of kind of protection. Um, and, and as um, was brought out, some of those databases then become uh, Facebook, Facebook pages and other sorts of ways of circulating um, information to protect. And so in thinking about you know, sex workers' rights, that struggle is hardly done. You know, I mean, the way, even in terms of uh, in California, there were um, uh, anti-trafficking laws that actually had the opposite effect. Uh, instead of stopping trafficking, um, it sometimes formed a kind of a way of criminalizing sex workers uh, and undermining their work. But in the end, I keep coming back to, um, uh, to Margaret Prescott's argument that sex work should be a right. It should not be um, regulated by the state. And, but but sex, work, sex workers need to be protected. But at the same time, to recognize that sex work is also partly largely a product of the constraints placed on society as a whole, especially on the economic constraints on black women and women of color to be able to make a living. And so one of the arguments that they kept making over and over again is that these women are vulnerable because they can't make a living in, in other ways. And this is one option for them uh, to survive. All right, well, we have a couple of other people who have indicated they wanna ask questions. So we have Ruben Tarajano. Um, and can you, if you go ahead and activate your camera and microphone, we'd appreciate it. Hi, Dr. Kelly, uh, big fan of your work. Thank you, uh, thank you for this. Uh, my question is, in your view, considering, of course, the importance to ground ourselves in a historical framework, how do organizers, activists, and scholars push against carceral logics in research and policy, which aim to combat racial femicide? That's a great, that's a great question. And I, I actually don't um, think I have to give like the universal answer only because what I can do is suggest the people who are actually doing that right now. Um, uh, certainly Ruth Wilson Gilmore, uh, all of her work and the work that's coming out uh, change everything. The book is gonna come out in May. Uh, I mentioned Mary McCabe, uh who's got a brand new book which is a lot of it's about just that, you know, um, how do we push against uh, the carceral logics, um, uh, specifically in terms of the uh, black women's right to defend themselves from violence, and of course, to defend themselves from, from um, lethal violence uh, in Beth Ritchie. One of the ways I think to be very specific in terms of trying to address your question is that we have to make a bold move. Uh, by bold move, it means to think about what does it mean to be held accountable. Accountability, you can't sort of force people to be accountable. Um, but, account but you can't have accountability if people don't feel um, uh, free to be able to admit their crime, their violation. You know, because to do that, to say, you know, I, I was wrong, I did this, um, I, I need to be held accountable. Within, a carceral, within the carceral logic, the first thing is, is prison, or in some cases, death penalty, um, without the option of being able to figure out different ways to kind of make 
to, 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 to deal with accountability. That's not the, accountability is not the same as not taking responsibility or not having consequences. Consequences are, are part of it. But to decide what those consequences are without having to lock people up. And that includes the police. That includes the police. I mean, that's a hard thing to do. And when we talk about the gruesome violence that I can't even, it's unspeakable. Um, and people commit those crimes. It's very hard to convince someone that, look, you know, they shouldn't be locked up. But the first thing that happens is that um, even during the Me Too movement, when those say, when people come out and say, well, they need to be locked up forever and throw away the key, they get applauded because the culture is one that accepts carceral logics for the, for the most heinous crimes. You know, even those who call themselves abolitionists sometimes are not willing to take that last leap. So it's very hard work, but it means a change in the culture, uh, a radical change in the culture, and not you can't legislate your way out of that. You know. Thank you, though, for the for the question. All right. So we have another question from Savannah Hardwick, who asks, "How do you think it is best for white people in the LGBT plus community to encourage more anti-racism thought within our community?" Um. Well, again, I always hate to be in a position where it's like, what's the answer to the question? Um, I just feel like some work is being done already, exactly. Um, and one of the organizations I really admire that's doing a lot of work around this is Surge, showing up for racial justice, whose leadership uh, is, is largely LGBTQ. Um, and, you know, Carla Wallace, who actually is a really a long time organizer in Louisville around um, LGBTQ rights and, and struggles um, is one of the main organizers and founders of Surge. And so Surge has been doing this work, but trying to deal with it, not simply as allies, that is to say, stepping on the sidelines to try to convince people, white people, that somehow they don't have an investment or stake in anti-racism, but actually realizing that anti-racism is not an issue to, to be allied with. It's an issue to jump in as in a comradely way and to fight at every level. So one of the things that they were doing um, is you know, trying to you know, deal with, with communities uh, around uh, racial and sexual violence directly, to talk to people, to build, um, to create spaces of safety. Um, but most importantly, to educate uh, uh, people, you know, around the harm that racism does um, to all of us, to all of us, uh, knowing that it's differential, you know. So it's it's very difficult but necessary work, but I do think that um, the work is being being done, especially by Serge and others, in really kind of robust ways. Great. So our next question comes from Josh Rosenberg. If there are others who have questions, um, please get on the queue and I'll, I'll call on you. Josh, if you can activate your camera and microphone. Unmute. There you go. Uh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Kelly, I'm reading Harsha Walia's Border and Rule, which you wrote the foreword for, and it's excellent. Um, and I appreciate the foreword too. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, migrants' issues and femicide and the vulnerability and disposability of migrant women. Right. Well, that that book itself will gives you a lot. I mean, it's it's a brilliant book. Um, and you know, let me say briefly. I mean, the the numbers and living living here in LA the numbers of uh, women being killed on the border, on both sides of the border, are just staggering, just staggering. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times it gets presented in the press as like victims of the drug war. But it's not that simple because of course, femicide predates the expansion of the, the drug war. Uh, and it also tells us something about the vulnerability of women in this escalating violence, which is tied to all kinds of things, uh, climate catastrophe, um, poverty, um, 
the Machiadoras and neoliberal policies of creating horrible working conditions uh, on, on just south of the border uh, in, in Northern Mexico. Um, and that's just there. But if you think about femicide around from you know, India, uh, the Arab world, um, the Caribbean, Latin America, I mean, we have amazing examples uh, uh, in Latin America in particular in the struggle against femicide. Brazil is a really great example where um, feminist organizations have built real networks that have been the model for some of the things I've been talking about toward the end for Sister to Sister and others to protect and uh, to protect women and families, children and men who are also victims um, of, of uh, sexual violence. But you know, it's very hard work. It's hard work because uh, in the case of migrants who are already vulnerable, already undocumented, already don't have the protection of the state, but instead seen as criminalized by the state. You have incidents, as you know, of undocumented women who cannot, even if they want to call the police for protection, cannot otherwise go subject to deportation. And deportation basically means prison and then deportation. So there's ways in which the whole structure is designed to perpetuate um, femicide. And just a reminder, you know, when Sister to Sister was formed um, uh, back 20 some odd years ago, one of the issues uh, that Paula Rojas, who's founder, was talking about was the fact that um, in, uh, in that community in Brooklyn, many of the women, the families were undocumented and they just could not call on law enforcement to protect them and had to basically deal with it uh, and until the community came together to protect people. So safe houses, safe spaces are also about um, this uh, about um, sanctuary, you know, and those things come together. The sanctuary movement as a way to protect those from deportation is all ought, ought to be and often is sanctuary against um, against violence, um, intimate partner violence, other forms of violence, um, and that's only that only touches the, the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, but this is an issue that is global and massive, and if you just just with the way like the, the, the numbers of women victims of femicide versus those killed by the police formally, it's just so much bigger, but connected, but connected, you know? I don't know if that answered the question, but. Okay, well, the next question comes from Jenna Lloyd. Oh, okay. I, I thought I'd take, take a moment. Um, I wanted to return us to um, Los Angeles mm -hmm. and Margaret Prescott's work. Um, and in the early, uh, I was living there in the early 2000s. And so um, was able to take part in some of the anti-war organizing that Global mm. Women's Strike was doing. And it occurs to me that um, like one of their demands um, was about the way in which military spending all around the world, right, should be diverted. So this form of like structural, there was this um, structural violence in the part of militarism um, that though that could be those resources could be redirected towards uh, towards life. Um, and it occurs to me that so many of the demands now around redirecting re resources from policing towards fulfilling people's lives, there's like a very strong resonance there. And I guess I'm asking um, maybe your thoughts on thinking through like um, at this particular juncture of political organizing of again, naming militarism as central to also those, po those police budgets and those military right. budgets. Like, can right. we say both of them? Right, <laughs> exactly. That's an excellent, excellent point. In fact, their, their slogan, if I remember correctly, correctly for the, the International Women's Day theme was invest in caring, not killing. And that was one of the things that Margaret was really uh, key about. And I think that's extremely important. I mean, you know, it's amazing. Um, to think about how much money is spent. And, and here we're entering the Biden years where the Biden Harris years where they're already, already using military forces to attack uh, uh, Syria. 
and we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, the same person who is bragging all the times about his role in the the um, the, the legislation against domestic violence uh, act. I mean, this is Joe Biden, and doesn't see the connection. I think it's really, really uh, essential to do that. And I think that um, there are groups like right now, um, uh, youth dissenters, for example, a new formation of amazing organizers uh, who are making the connection between militarism, uh, police violence, and um, sexual violence, uh, making the, direction, the, the connection directly. Um, I think that uh, the other statistic that I didn't present, we talk about police involved in domestic violence, certainly um, military personnel have the highest rates of domestic violence. And I'm not talking about even just the whole question of femicide as a whole, but just in terms of sexual assault and assault against women, assault on women, you see uh, military personnel. So there's something wrong with militarism, not just in terms of imperialism, not just in terms of the obvious things of, of waging these expensive ongoing wars, but what it does to our character as people, what it does to, to men who are responsible for killing other people as if it's okay. It's not an accident that all the, that most of those people who showed up at the, um, at the Capitol, uh, you know, were, military and police, you know? Um, and it's once you start to scratch the surface and start to look at the question of their relationship to um, uh, violence against women, I think we're gonna see a lot of interesting things. You see, so um, I think it's really, really important just to, just to both to think about that, to, to restore that slogan, invest in caring, not killing. Um, and, and I really appreciate that, that intervention and something we have to all keep in mind. Okay, well, we have one final question. Um, so Daniel asks, can you speak to the dangers of increased co-optation of LGBTQ issues by actors that continue to perpetrate violence toward the same communities? Um, can I speak to it? And by the same communities, you mean, um, which communities, like black and brown communities, LGBTQ communities, um, is it, because it could go in, in many, many different directions. Oh, LGBT. LGBT. Okay, thank you. Yeah, got it. Yeah, you, you, you know, um, let me see if I could see the question. Um, okay, there we go. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, it's something that I, many people, I think, have, have dealt with. Um, and co-optation is always, uh, an issue in any movement. Um, and I think that one of the things we're seeing is in um, the really important abolitionist work of, of accountability and transformative justice that within uh, LGBTQ uh, uh, IA communities, we're beginning to see a kind of reckoning with harm and violence within those communities. Um, the question is whether, of course, is that, but then the question of, of co-optation, I think, um, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to sort of think more about it in terms of what particular organizations, but uh, involved in, in acts of, of, of perpetuating um, harm and, and co-opting, but I certainly think that there's a kind of liberal, um, discourse, which does in fact uh, um, coalesce with carceral feminism, which says, you know, um, uh, that we actually need to move toward fighting for, you know, participation in the military, um, fighting for, you know, full access and equality to control and have uh, uh, a say so over those uh, institutions that actually harm um, masses of people, vulnerable people, including LGBTQ uh, uh, communities. Um, and then also there's a question of, of racism within uh, various uh, circles that have to be addressed. So 
I mean, I don't know if that necessarily answers the question, but I think that um, the dangers are there. Uh, Co-optation is always an issue. It's not a new issue. Um, and that uh, as, long as, as, as long as we're moving in a direction of really dealing with uh, transformative justice strategies and accountability, um, if we continue to do that, then it's gonna make co-optation uh, more difficult uh, in the end, I think. But again, um, look, I'm dealing with, I see co-optation all the time in, in um, the, uh, whether you're talking about Black Lives Matter movement, movements, or movements in which um, Black elites in the name of abolition um, are signing laws that actually are making it more difficult uh, for people to get out of prison, you know? Um, you know, so I think that um, there's a lot of, of issues that have to be attended to. I don't know if that's a, a, a good answer, but I do um, appreciate the issue uh, in the end, you know. 